Hello everyone. Time once again for scripture verse by verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Acts and we come today to Acts chapter 2 verse 37. I really hated to leave off where I did last time but we just simply ran out of time. <clears throat> and uh, well, well we'll get right into it in a second. I do want to remind you that uh, the scripture verse by verse website is found at the com, and that you can study God's Word in its entirety and do it at your pace, at your convenience too. However you want to do it, whatever book of the Bible you want to study or study the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation and whatever you want to do, totally up to you. Study it verse by verse using my audio Bible messages, three complete series going through the Bible are there for you at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> and Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> last time we were looking at Peter's sermon. First sermon in the church age. It's the day of Pentecost. Peter and the other apostles are filled with the Spirit of God. They began to speak in other tongues. Crowds of people, thousands of people gathered around them, wondering what in the world was going on because these people were from different countries, all in Jerusalem for the Passover. They spoke different languages, but they all heard the apostles speak in their own language. And they're talking about the great things, the mighty works of God. And Peter started preaching a sermon. And I'm telling you, he hit them hard. He told them about Jesus, the one that they crucified. And he, he accused them. He said, you put them to death. You murdered them. You killed them. And God raised them from the dead, putting the blame square on their shoulders and making it clear that they killed God's son, their long-awaited Messiah. But God raised them from the dead. And he sent the Holy Spirit. And so you can imagine the boldness of Peter to stand up and say these things. And that's because he was filled with the Spirit of God. He was under the control of the Holy Spirit. And when you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, you're a John the Baptist. You're a Jesus. You're a Peter. And these people, can you imagine the looks on their faces as they are brought face to face with the reality that they murdered God's son. And with that, we pick it up in verse 37. Now when they, the crowd, remember, thousands of people, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were under so much conviction, filled with guilt, filled with sorrow over their sin, afraid of God's wrath because Peter called them God's enemies and they want to know what they can do. What should we do? More or less admitting that they were wrong, certainly not coming against Peter in any way. He spoke the bold truth of Almighty God and they were brought under conviction. No one ever gets saved if the word of God is not spoken with authority. No one is ever offended, but no one is ever saved. No one is ever offended, but no one is ever sanctified. It's just this lukewarmness where everyone is comfortable. And if the preacher is talented enough, he can entertain and get people to follow and get a nice offering and, and get a nice crowd and a nice sized church. And it's all for nothing. It accomplishes absolutely nothing for Almighty God. Not a thing. It's sort of like shaving with a banana. You won't cut yourself. You have to worry about any pain. But you're not going to, you're not going to, get rid of the whiskers either. And so we see 
They certainly were cut. What shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Stop right there. The very first word that Peter spoke in response to their question, What must we do? was the word repent. Turn away from your sin. Repentance is turning away from your sin and turning to Jesus Christ. Turn away from sin, turn to God. Turn away from sin, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's repentance. It's a complete turnaround. Regret is not. Reformation is not. Reformation is just turning away from something bad. Repentance is turning from what is wrong to doing what is right. And repent is what they must do. Now let me make this clear. That does not mean that they must change their ways before they can come to Christ. That's not what that means at all. Repentance is a description of what coming to Christ really is. It's not cleaning up your act, making yourself worthy of coming to Christ, because you'll never accomplish that. Repentance is a description of what coming to Christ is. It is turning from sin and turning to Christ with a determination to trust in his finished work on the cross and to live for him. In other words, to make him your Lord and Savior. That's repentance. And you can't do that unless you repent. You can't turn to Christ with sincerity unless you are turning away from sin. You just don't mean business. If all you're doing is tacking Jesus onto your life, you haven't repented and you haven't gotten anything. And so Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Baptism is a command. It's a command here. It's a command in Matthew 28 19 where Jesus says go into all the world and preach the gospel and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit it is a command to the apostles to command or it, it is a command to the apostles to command sinners to repent and be baptized and it's a companion of salvation I'll say this, given an opportunity, a real Christian will be baptized if they have not been. A person is, is out of God's will until they have been baptized. Obedience and baptism are both demonstrations of saving faith. It is God's will for you to receive Christ and then be baptized. And so he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Water baptism is not magical. However, it is the outward symbol of what happens at the moment of salvation. And it is so closely related to the reality of salvation that Peter doesn't even make a distinction. And so it is important to be baptized. And to refuse baptism is to deny the faith that you claim to have. And so he says in the end of verse 38 and verse 39, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins 
and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Anyone who repents, anyone who turns to Christ, will automatically receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift that is given to real Christians. He is the reason, therefore, that a Christian is changed from the inside out. The Holy Spirit comes in, regenerates them, creates a new person inside of them, a new person that wants to obey Jesus, that wants to glorify God, that fear, feels terrible when they do not. Those are all marks of a Christian. It has to be there because the Holy Spirit is there. Verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself from this stubborn, unruly generation. And they're a part of it. I mean, he made that clear in his sermon. They're a part of it. I mean, they killed the Son of God. They killed their Messiah. They killed the one who God exalted to his right hand. They're in trouble. They're unruly. They're rebellious. And, and Peter says, here's your opportunity to save yourself from that mob. Get out of that mess. He kept preaching. And there, those words are not recorded, but with many words, he warned the people to separate themselves to get out of that morally twisted generation. And we are in a morally twisted generation today. And it gets worse every single day as more and more sin is called normal and tolerated. And not just tolerated, but preferred. It's bad. And the only way you're going to be safe from hell is to let Jesus pluck you out of this morally depraved generation by repenting and receiving him as Lord and Savior. And so we see very clearly that salvation is not something that is simply added to a perverted lifestyle. Receiving Christ is not just adding something to a perverted lifestyle. It must replace that lifestyle. 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Wow, what a message. Peter preached the pure word of God. He didn't hold back. He didn't tickle anyone's ears. He was more interested in just communicating what God wanted him to say. And he did. And 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people repent. 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people are baptized. They were saved and they proved that their faith was real by being baptized. 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so we see that prayer and the Word of God and Holy Communion is what the early Christians did when they had church. There wasn't anything complicated about it. Prayer, the Word of God, and Holy Communion. That's what they did. That was the focus of their surface, but more than that, it was the focus of their life. The rest of their activities were like spokes coming out of that spiritual hub. Verse 43, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. You could tell that God was working, not just because of the apostles' miracles, but because of how the people were afraid. When you're in the presence of God, if you're not right with God, 
you're going to be afraid. If you have any sense, any spiritual sense left in your soul, and your soul is not as hard as a rock from turning away from truth, you are going to be afraid. You are going to feel guilty in the presence of God. And how does one feel the presence of God today? He feels it. She feels it. When a man of God proclaims the pure word of God and brings people face to face with the reality of God and Jesus Christ. And then people are brought to the place. They come face to face with the reality that there is a God. His son is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. And you are in a lot of trouble if you don't repent and receive him. The word of God declares God, God's ways and God. And the sinner in the presence of that sort of thing is going to be afraid. And that's what is needed for souls to get saved. That is what is needed for the saved to continue on in repentance and become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what they did. And again, you can tell God was working, not just because of the apostles' miracles, but because of how these people were afraid. The apostles were living for God. The Christians were living for God. The apostles were on the cutting edge, living for God, speaking the word of God. And boy, people didn't take it lightly. They were afraid. And again, I say, there is not a lighthearted, buddy-buddy attitude toward God when you are in his presence. Saved or not, there's a fear. For the unsaved, it's a terror. For the saved, it's a godly, respectful fear. Verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, which means that they shared everything. All the Christians shared everything. This was not communism. It was a volunteering, it was a volunteered sharing. They were so filled with the Spirit of God, so in love with Jesus Christ, that they had such a heavenly focus, such an eternal perspective, that they didn't care about earthly things. They used earthly things to satisfy their needs and to help others, but they didn't covet earthly things, material possessions. They were neither here nor there. If they had it, they shared it with somebody who needed it because, because they were not putting their confidence in material possessions. They were filled with God. And where your heart is, the Bible says, where your, no, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And so their treasure was in heaven. Their treasure was in their relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's where their heart was. Not on material things. Verse 45, again. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Boy, that's a that's a an example of what I'm talking about here. And an illustration of what they were like on the inside. It's a very clear indication that God was working in their lives. The Lord Jesus Christ was more important to these people than anyone or anything, including their possessions, and that's why they shared freely. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what else they did or did not have. They had Jesus. When your relationship with God is so tight that Jesus because, becomes the all-encompassing thing that controls your mind, that fills your mind, you're not going to care about other things. You're not going to care about the material possessions of this world is what I'm saying. And if you have them, that's fine. If you don't have them, that's fine too. Big deal if you don't have the latest furniture. 
Big deal if you don't have the latest car. Doesn't matter. That's not where you find your contentment. Too much worldliness in the world. Too many Christians spending way too much money on the things of this world. And it's indicative of their heart because of what Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. I didn't make it up. He's the one who said it. If you find yourself sitting in a, in the midst of a lot of material possessions, way more than you need, and you barely give anything to the work of God, shame on you. You're in trouble. Your walk with the Lord is not what it should be. Again, it's indicative that you've got a problem. Look at these people. Oh, just measure yourself by these people. I'm not making this up, am I? Verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So they worshiped together and they hung out with each other and they were having a great time in the Lord. And the apostles were leading them all. What a wonderful time. They were having a great time. And you know, Christian fellowship is important to our spiritual well-being. And the, they did these things. And with good results too. But you know what? They were having true Christian fellowship. This wasn't getting together and watching some secular movie. This, this, isn't, this isn't some professing Christians getting together and watching some smutty television program that the world laughs at. This isn't the Christians getting together and going to a rock concert just because it happens to be labeled Christian. This is Christians getting together and fellowshipping in the Word of God, sharing the Word of God, feeding on the Word of God, and Holy Communion, and just having a good time. That's true Christian fellowship. And they were all in the same boat because they all loved Jesus. That's Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship has to revolve around the Word of God and prayer, or it's not Christian fellowship. It isn't. It's a garden party. It's a get-together, but that's not Christian fellowship. Getting together and watching some movie is not Christian fellowship. It's just not, unless Jesus is the center. So they worshiped together, they hung out with each other, and they had a good time because it was Christian fellowship. It was focused on Jesus. 47. What else were they doing? Well, we know it was focused on Jesus because look at 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. No one can cause the church to grow except God. It was the Lord who added to the church daily. You know, sometimes you, you see books or you, you hear people talking about church growth techniques, church growth principles. <laughs> that is... That is so disgustingly worldly, but I know it's popular. Well, we have to do it. I, look, 30 years ago, I was a part of this rot, briefly, because I never liked it, and I knew it was wrong. Well, we have to do a demographic study and see if it's worth our time putting a church in this area or that area, and then we have to go down the line and you know, follow this workbook on church growth techniques and we have to hire somebody to promote our church and, you know, 
use business, business techniques and principles to build our church. And everybody's so proud of the work that they do, and it's all a bunch of baloney. Couldn't be more unspiritual, couldn't be more unbiblical, and what you end up getting is a bunch of nothing. What you end up getting is a bunch of people coming to your group because you've got a good system and you've got a good program. No one can cause God's church to grow except God himself. He is the one who added to the church daily. And again, you can get people to join your group if you entice them with what they want. If your pastor is creative enough and funny enough or maybe intellectual enough where he can impress people with words that no one understands, you can get people to come to, to, uh, to listen to that stuff and join your group. And if you have, you know, potluck dinners and stuff like that, I'm, yeah, I'm not against potluck dinners. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you can do all of these outward things and get people to come to your group. But you're not building a church. God alone is the only one who can build the church. True spiritual growth is only produced by God. It's a byproduct of walking in the Spirit, period. The moment you get out into techniques, into church growth methods, you are operating in the flesh, and what you will reap is flesh. Whatsoever we sow, that we reap. What you win a person with is what you have won them to. If you win a person with chili suppers, if you win a person with movies and other sorts of entertainment from the pulpit, from the musicians, if you win a person with that kind of stuff, then that's what you have won them to. But look at the pattern of the early church. The Lord added souls to this church daily, and they were real conversions. They were heartfelt people who truly repented of their sins and truly asked Jesus Christ to come into their life to be their Lord and Savior, and they produced fruit, and that's why the church just kept growing, because this is how God builds the church. It has nothing to do with techniques. It has nothing to do with methodologies. The people, what did they do? What did this early church do? They took communion, right? They taught the word. They preached the word. They taught the word. They took communion. They prayed. And through those things, the Holy Spirit worked. And new people, people came. The hungry came. Those who truly had a heart for God deep down in their soul, even if they didn't know it, they came. And it clicked, and they repented, and they got saved, and there were no shortcuts, and there were no quote unquote bridges to the unsaved. The only bridge that there is to the unsaved is what we find here prayer, word of God, holy communion. And souls were getting saved. So you take communion, you teach the word, you pray. And then you teach the word more, and then you pray more, and then you take more communion. And then you just keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that. That's what the early church did. And after that, it's up to the Lord to supply the growth. But you can't, you can't fix what doesn't go fast enough for you. And you can't make something happen if God isn't the one making it happen when it comes to this. I'm way out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible. Listen. Follow along at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, this is a faith ministry. I'm not underwritten by a large church. I depend on you. Faith ministry means I teach the Word of God straight. I'm obedient to God, and I trust that by faith, He will move people who He wants to move. And again, He will add to the church through the word of God that is proclaimed. And some of you, I know, will give. And some of you, I know, will pray. And that's what it means to have a faith ministry. And if you want to be a part of this ministry, click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com 
and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. So long.